Thank you, everyone. And uh, yes, we got our third chair up. So I'm going to invite the panel members to come up and join me now. And um, as Terry was talking about, times of change are times of opportunity. And in fact, um, I'm here to tell you about some of the transitions that are happening in the marketplace because that's what my team does. We track the transitions in the marketplace. And I uh, guide a team, uh, a small team of researchers, uh, as uh, you were just told, in cloud and data center research. And one of the things that is very important that I think uh, we do is we try to separate the hype from the reality. Because in many, many cases, we believe the market is going to move faster than it actually will. And if we don't plan our business clocks by that market, we don't succeed. And so I'm just going to share a few charts with you, and then I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves, and then we'll go through a couple of rapid fire questions. And I think uh, we'll find it very interesting. Uh, I did have a pre-brief with the panel, and there was uh, a lot of ideas that we hope to share with you that I think spell nothing but opportunity, or everything but offer everything as opportunity for Canada going forward. And hopefully the people in this room can be part of the ecosystem and the collaboration that Terry talked about to make this happen. So with that, let me see if I can get the slide to advance. And that is the cover slide, uh, and that's me. And um, with that, I want to talk about one transition, and I'm going to talk about off-premise cloud services now. We've already heard the cloud mentioned several times, and whether we believe it or not, much of what is going to happen in the next decade will be driven by this transformation. And it's a very important phase we're entering now in terms of moving to cloud services because everyone thinks about the cloud about agility, which is true. But the new phase we're entering, entering in, and that may spell lots of opportunity for carriers and for networking, is something I call the meta cloud, where enterprises use more than one cloud service provider. So in our research, already the average North American enterprise is using eight or more different cloud service providers. And in fact, we've already seen two carriers, Verizon and BT, jump in, realize the opportunity, and want to be that front door to the enterprise to help them connect to all the cloud service providers they're using. So yes, there's opportunity. And the question is, how big and how fast is the cloud growing? Well, that's part of the research we do. And uh, in a year, I do about 100,000 miles in airplanes going across the globe, figuring out what's going on in China, what's going on in Europe, what's going on here in North America, spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley. And here's our projection for the cloud services market. So this is revenue to cloud service providers like Amazon, that Terry mentioned, which by the way, we do track, and uh, our numbers very much collaborate with what Terry said, that uh, Amazon's grown near three times in the last uh, year, and has cut price many, many times, yet they still make a profit, because they understand how to leverage the technology to drive efficiency. And so you can see a very healthy ramp, and we see a very healthy ramp in the middle part of the graph, which is where the new innovation in cloud services comes. Not from copying Amazon to offer compute, uh, just like they do, but bringing innovative services on top of compute infrastructure. A lot of opportunity there for Canadians to find a way into the marketplace. The other thing uh, I want to shift gears is this is an open networking conference talking about open innovation, and SDN is at the heart of opening up the network. But there's also a lot of confusion about SDN. One confusion is that it's more than one market with more than one set of requirements. And if we're going to be successful in that market, we need to understand that. So we have SDN, which is two markets. One is carrier SDN, which focuses on automating the carrier network. We have data center and enterprise SDN, which is way more uh, IT-centric in its requirements, driven by a different culture, and uh, uses a different set of solutions. And so the blue uh, graph you see here on the right is the 2019 figures. The larger blue is the data center and enterprise opportunity for SDN. The carrier number is the lighter blue on top. The other very important carrier market, where I think a lot of the focus of Sengen is, is the green one, which is carrier NFT, which again is a different market with different requirements. 
and we had a discussion yesterday evening about open energy, very much focused on that. The other thing I want to share with you is if you're wondering about whether or not open networking uh, makes sense, uh, just take a look at our forecast for uh, in-use SDN in the data center. And if you look at the green part of the graph, one of the fastest growing parts, that is where the open networking using bare metal switches is. So you can see the hyper growth there. To me, that points to opportunity for us to succeed. And with that, I think I'm just going to share with you just one or two more things around our roadmap. Because I want to highlight that what I think is about to happen now is the move to the autonomous network, which means that the 20 years of investment in research in AI and machine learning is now about to break out. And if we can find a way to innovate, drive that into networking, I think that we can be world leaders. And so it's something to think about as an opportunity for investment. And with the last thing, if, any, if anybody's worried that open networking is not going to take hold, and I've heard discussions that people think that open networking is stalled. Well, I will tell you that I don't believe it's stalled at all. It's actually going along at the pace that uh, we believe it should be going along at. It's just that the hype has been running a bit ahead. ahead. But we still project that by 2020, 25% 20, of all the network ports, switch ports sold into the data center will be open networking. So think about that. That's a huge opportunity, huge transition, as Terry mentioned. And so with that, I'm going to open it up to the panel, and I'd like to introduce the panel members. So please go ahead and introduce yourself. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Bruce Gregory, um, co-founder and CEO of a company called Corsa Technology. Uh, I got to admit, compared to Terry, I'm a, a bit of a piker. Uh, Corsa is only the seventh company that, uh, that I've, I've actually founded. and. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll take on a success. Uh, we build a, a very high performance, very programmable net networking platform that allows software-defined networks to actually function. Uh, we provide, at some point, somebody has to move the bits in a programmable fashion. And we provide the hardware that, uh, that sits at the core of the network that, uh, that allows you to do that. I apologize, I don't do business in India, but we're working on it. But we are global. The interesting thing is we're in Africa, we're in Europe, we're in Asia, uh, obviously North America and South America. Interestingly, not in Canada yet. Uh, working on it um, and, and working with Sengen. But, uh, but I think that'll be, you know, maybe part of the discussion today is um, it's an interesting question. Why is that? Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Paul Session. I'm responsible for uh, networking business at Ring River. We're uh, Fully owned subsidiary of Intel uh, and uh, responsible for next generation networks and software solutions. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Chong Hong Long. After I finished my uh, PhD, I joined Notel, BRNR and Notel, uh, for more than six years. I joined Carlton in 2001. I've been working on uh, several areas software engineering, cloud computing, and computer networks. Well, thank you. And I know when we had our call to set the panel up, we had a large discussion around what does openness mean. And even though a lot of panels debate this, I think we need to have a short discussion about that here. So I'm going to ask the panel of members to keep all of their responses brief. We have a short time in which I'd like to cover six topics. And so please, your, your top three ideas. Less is more when it comes to uh, this panel. And so let's talk about the three degrees of openness and whether we're talking about open networks, open source, open interoperability, what is it? Um, so, so we raise this, there's sort of, there's projects like the Open Compute Project at Facebook, which is really an open piece of hardware. It's a design that's agreed upon by a community published and it's, it's kind of a manufacturing exercise in the end. Uh, whoever can manufacture the best um, kind of wins the business. It's very, very commodity driven. And I got to admit, not particularly interesting to, to people like me. Um, open source, if you just think Linux and, and think of where Linux is in the world and how that, uh, that operating system was developed, that's, that's really open source. And 
it's a, it's a, you know, how the community should develop product or how, sh how we, we should develop platforms that everybody can participate in. The trick in networking is um, open interoperability and why don't different vendors, um, why don't, doesn't the equipment from different vendors work with each other and not work well? And, and I think for us in this ecosystem that we're talking about for SDN and, and IoT, that's actually the next challenge is the interoperability issues. We don't have a choice. We're going to be forced by our customers to open that up. And so what does that mean for Rainy River? Well, you know, I, I kind of look at it, I like trying to begin with the end in mind, right? You know, and I think it's really all about, you know, playing well with others. And all of those aspects need to kind of work together, whether they're the open source or different, uh, you know, standards committees, these all need to work together. And beginning with that end in mind, and really setting up the right sort of collaborative, so almost coopetition uh, environment is the important part about what, what that means. And having the right environment to set that up. That's, that's what it means to, to us and what I think we need to focus on. And what about the academic community? Well, uh, I've been working with uh, fourth year students on IoT related, related uh, applications in the past uh, five, six years. Well, one of the big issues was interoperability. We bought some devices, next year we may, may not be able to use them. Or we want to interwork with other devices, we can do this. As a designer, or a, it's very frustrating because we have to keep changing our design, keep changing our devices. You can imagine as users of those devices, okay, if I buy some devices, next day I have to change, or I have to do a lot of configuration, I have to make a lot of changes, well, I'm not going to use it. Well, thank you, and actually, this leads us to the next topic that I wanted to hear from the committee about, which was, what are the opportunities for innovation for Canada when it comes to open networking? Let's assume a world where it's going to happen. Uh, I think our numbers show that. And we can't do everything, but we want to succeed with particular focuses of expertise. What would that be? Where would you invest if you were making that choice for Canada? I'll, I'll take a crack at that. I, you know, we heard this morning about um, just the pedigree within Canada about building networks, right? Whether you know, we heard about you know Mitel and Newbridge. We got Sienna, Nortel. We have, we, we have such a strong pedigree. And if we look at where this network is going, we heard from Terry about how it's going to be driving the, the global economies. It's going to be even more important, almost a critical infrastructure. You know, one of the interesting stats I heard the other day, almost $3.1 trillion is driven by the uh, mobile networks in the global economy. Almost 5% of the global gross domestic product. Those networks have to be reliable. We know how to build that we can participate in driving that dependability and reliability into those networks because we're going to be dependent on those for all sorts of next solutions and um, you know, really interesting business cases and use cases going forward. And I think we have a, a unique opportunity there with the skills that we have. Anybody else care to weigh in? Well, I think the, the, the thing that, that sort of stands out for me is that Canada has been such a powerhouse intellectually and such a powerhouse in innovating in technology and uh, we've started to flag a little bit in, in that sense and we look now and, and this is a global uh, it's, it's a global solution it's a global problem um, there's a lot of brain power in Canada and, and what we actually need to do I think very much start with the end in mind what is the end goal of what we're trying to build and uh, and then sort of break that down to chunks that are manageable for us to take on you know if we just try and solve a global problem all in one shot, we're not going to be able to do that. But the key for me is that we have so much brain power here, and so much ability to grow new capability and new intelligence, and it's almost, you know, we almost have a duty to, to replace with Nortel gone, and with, you know, with, with the decline of, of the people that grew that. We as a, a community, we kind of have the, the responsibility that Canada's going to succeed, and we've got to continue to invest in all of that. Anything on the radar screen at the academia that uh, we should be looking at? What, what are people looking at that's N plus 3 or N plus 4 that we can start to build the competency and bring it to N plus 1? Well, we just heard from the from mayor about 90% 90, about 90 of R&D in telecommunications actually is done here in Ottawa. 
So we have a very good uh, environment and a lot of opportunities to collaborate between the universities and the uh, industry. I also, uh, actually just about two, two weeks ago, I heard a, a story. The, uh, after Apollo 13, because the mission failed, so NASA decided to hire some engineers that can think out of the box. So they hire professional psychologists to design a set of questions just to try to hire uh, some engineers that, that can think of, out of the box, that are more creative. And they also use that particular set of questions and test different, uh, different people at different age. Well, okay, very interestingly, at five years old, okay, about 98% <laughs> of those five-year-olds actually are in the category of genius in terms of creativity. And five years later, the number dropped to 32%. And five more years later, the number becomes only 12%. And at age 25, only 2% of those people actually are in the uh, genius category. So when you talk about some of the open, open networking, open interoperability, okay, one thing that uh, okay, uh, could be open-minded or open-variant, we have a lot of opportunities here in, in all of our industry partners could just help some or measure some projects and let the students do and stimulate their creativity. Well, thank you. I'm actually going to wade in and put two stakes in the ground if I were to be able to uh, direct investment. One was I'd be looking at technologies that make hardware, that is silicon, as programmable as software. We've seen some early efforts in that area, and I think that the diversity in hardware platforms in networking today is uh, much, much behind that of compute. And we'll only see more of that. Other examples are specialized co-processors for doing AI and machine learning like the Tensor that Google has uh, been working on. And I'm not sure how many people here are aware that in Microsoft Azure's data center, not only is there a pool of x86 capacity available, but there's a pool of GPUs available in every server, or there's a pool of GPUs, some in every server, for uh, accelerating AI. And the next thing I would do is I'd make an investment in how to apply AI and machine learning technology to bring the concepts of automation and self-driving to the network. Because I think uh, as more as law uh, is uh, not allowing us to scale anymore in, at the rate that we have been in the past, we have to scale by increasing, by using more devices, increasing parallelism, and that's an area we can excel as a country, given the intellectual playing power that we all talked about. So let's move on. We still have a few more topics to talk about. Um, the next one I wanted to ask people about is, um, in terms of creating the ecosystem, what do we have to do to become a world leader? What changes still need to happen on top of the good work at Sengen to really put us center stage and make us a leader? So, so I, I, um, I, I do have to say this the Sengen Summit, and, and Sengen is kind of a shining example of what we need to do. This is a, this is a, a global effort that requires cooperation amongst intellectuals, amongst, uh, amongst companies, in order to put that network together and, and to, to really create a, almost a sandbox um, where sort of outside the day-to-day -day business constraints that all of us operate under, we have an ability to collaborate uh, and an ability to actually be the five-year-old who, who imagines what the future is because I don't actually know what everything's going to look like five years down the road, but I have a pretty good idea of what we have to build to be able to realize it. I can't do that on my own, and, and with a, a group like Sengen and, and a platform like the, the one that they provide, I think that's, if we're going to invest, that's what we need to invest in. And, and we need to take the risk. We don't know what the outcome's going to be. Okay, how about the uh, folks at Wind River, what would you like to see for Canada? Well, I guess I, I step back and uh, I think of like the uh, wild west of mobile apps, and I'm kind of fascinated by that. You know, 2008, I think there were 500 mobile apps. You know, a year later there were 100,000. Um, you know, last year.
year, I think there was a million. This year, there'll be two million. Um, you know, that's tremendous scalability. And how, how did that come about? How did they, how did they do that? You know, it wasn't just one, uh, one thing. It was, it was all about having access to the customers, right? Having uh, the ability to help uh, have some creativity and fostering an ecosystem uh, and enabling them to monetize those companies to monetize that value. And if I step back and I look at where we're heading with our mobile, our, our networks, right, the carriers, they have all those essential elements, the subscribers, the ability to monetize, the ability to build. I think if we can bring that to bear, I think that will be a, a tremendous opportunity for us to leverage going forward. But as we build that out, we need a sandbox. We need a place to collaborate and find those new use cases and, and really sort of um, expand our, uh, our imagination, but not necessarily just on the technology, but on the business cases themselves and how we monetize that value. I think we're going to limit ourselves by, by that first before we're going to limit ourselves on the technology side. So I think we need to foster that sort of creativity and imagination from that perspective. And we're, we're not the only ones, right? You know, I think uh, in China, they, uh, you know, Huawei has opened up their X labs, right? Very similar to uh, the, the Sengen approach. And we, we, need to, we need to do the same here to capture that imagination, focus it, and, and, and foster that sort of co-opetition that we, we need to really excel. Okay, and how do universities uh, see uh, the opportunity or what's missing? What, what more should we be doing? create the environment and candidates succeed. Or should teach less. <laughs> well, for for uh, the senior students or the graduate students, I really encourage them to work more with industry people like I told you we with what just uh, Paul said. We really should get them hands dirty to work on something instead of just teaching, teaching and teaching, especially for these new opportunities. Okay, they have tremendous potential for creativity. And if we just teach, 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 they, they only learn the old technologies. That's interesting. So we need a new mechanism for learning, exactly. which involves doing. Right. That's, that's very interesting. Actually, I would like to add one or two more things um, from my experience of traveling the world. And it's along the lines of what I heard from some of the other speakers already is that when I look at Canada and I compare what Canada has in terms of assets and small companies and I look at the rest of the world, I see people very strong in technology, very good inventors, but I see uh, a need to develop our strengths in the business side, in the marketing side, and understanding how to be visible at a, on the world stage. Uh, I can give you a very concrete example. As an analyst following the SDN and the cloud and data center markets, I get no end of calls from the US-based companies and companies around the world asking for 30 minutes to brief me on what's going on. Uh, no end of uh, attention when they're doing news releases, wanting to brief me, make sure I know about it, trying to get me to talk to reporters for them. I hardly ever get a call from a company in Canada. So, you know, the companies are there, but I don't hear from them. And if I'm not hearing from them, I bet my colleagues don't hear from them, which means they're not visible on the world stage. So something I would like to see change going forward, understanding that marketing is as important or more important than simply creating an invention. Okay, uh, the next question I had that uh, to address for, to ask the panel was, about building a complete workforce. And maybe I kind of started the discussion off, but uh, I'd like to hear you know, from your perspectives, a small company, Bruce, Wind River, and Academia, uh, what are we gonna do about it to build a, a complete workforce? And what does that mean? So, so that was, that was the, the perfect lead into what are the strengths, and I'll, I'll talk to Ottawa, not, not Canada in particular, but Ottawa in particular, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses? In, in what we do here, um, we are amazing technologists. We are lousy businessmen in, in general. Um, we, we don't have, and, and part of it is because we're not 
uh, in, in the last decade at least, we don't have a lot of large companies headquartered here. Or there's a lot of a lot of sort of branch office uh, or very small companies, and so we haven't built up that business marketing sales expertise to market ourselves globally. I'm not going to whine about that. That's on us that that we've allowed that to happen. So what are we doing? I mean, you know, we I'm creating a global company. I'm reaching out. I'm building offices in the U.S. I'm building offices in the U.K. I'm reaching out to where those people are, and and I've kind of gone. We don't have all the answers here. I have to go find the people that can do that. And I think we have to realize that from a skill perspective, if you don't have it, don't don't make that okay. Don't be Canadian about it. Don't say, oh, it's all right. We're really good at the technology, but you know, in the world of come and go buy it. Um, I do feel good. I'm one of the guys in Canada that does call you when cool things are going on. So you at, least, are. at least we learned <laughs> at least we learned one lesson. But I think that's that's what we need to recognize is that maybe it's not it's not the technology side right now that we need to be working on. It's the business side, it's the investment side. Um, you know, why don't we attract more investment? Um, Absolutely. Right. I, think, uh, I think we need to be a little bit more inquisitive. You know, I think Carrie was mentioning it earlier, right? We've got to ask those questions. Sometimes we get caught up in the technology and the cool technology, but we got to ask the right questions, you know. Um, with, uh, with my team, we're typically always asking, like, so what? Who cares? Why us? You know, so what? What, what have we changed? What have we, what have we done that's different? Who cares? What's the market we're going after? And what's our differentiated value? You know, we, we got to focus on some of those basic things and then figure out how we're going to monetize those and really capture that value. You know, I think we, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, wireless technology as the access. You know, there's uh, WTTX, right? Wireless to the X. You know, looking at that business case, in some cases, the return on investment in, in you know, that wireless access is, uh, you know, uh, two years versus about eight years with uh, fixed broadband. You know, so these are some really interesting things if we can get our heads around that and understand that, ask those right questions and probe. You know, we can get there. You know, we, we do get a little bit too enamored too quickly with the technology, all right? But, and, you know, ask those right questions, be inquisitive, and, uh, you know, uh, we can drive this economy. So what do we... Uh... How can we ask the academics to help us with some of these areas? It's all these areas. Yeah. From the academic perspective, it's also very challenging this day's work. At least based on, my, based on my understanding. Because now we're talking about different, different, different types of skills. Not only computer networks, the operating systems, Okay, we, we, we used VIA, virtual machines before, now containers are becoming very popular. Yeah, and software development, and plus smart application. And on top of that, we have all these devices, IoT things. So the, uh, the skill set becomes broader. So it's becoming challenging for uh, academia as well. But I would like to go back to my previous point. I would still encourage industry partners to uh, sponsor more projects okay, so that students can well, give them freedom and students can work on them. Okay, I do have another question now, and I think actually this might be, well, it's for everyone, but perhaps a little bit more towards uh, our industrials list than our academic. Um, what do you expect from universities? What role can the universities play that they might not be today to help you? And what you're doing. So, so actually, actually, what Dr. Long said, I think, is, is very much what we would like to see is I, I don't want uh, students coming to me who uh, know how to design a, a, a fur filter. I want students coming to me who know how to ask questions, who, who know how to learn, who are curious, who have a really good understanding of the, the core technology. But they don't have the answer. They, they have the question and the ability to develop answers. Um, and I will admit, uh, co-op programs, very, very strong, I think, in developing that skill because they get exposed to the way industry thinks early on. And so students coming out of non-co-op are at a bit of a disadvantage. They, they do catch up fairly quickly. Um, but that's, uh, you know, worry about teaching state-of-the-art thinking, not state-of-the-art design and, and state-of-the-art um, uh, problem solving skills, and then we'll take care of the rest. We have all the problems they can possibly want to solve. So. I guess, uh, you know, looking at it, 
the um, it, it's in, in the near future, right? We're we're going to be connecting. You know, we've got right now uh, you know, autonomous vehicles just on the horizon, right? We're we're going to have uh, drones, uh, robots, uh, all interconnected, smart factories, smart cities. You know, if we if we look at where the network is going to go and what we're going to need out of the network to connect that, right? There are going to be some some big disruptive challenges we need to get our head around. If you think of the real-time requirements, the safety critical requirements of interconnecting robots, smart factories that need to run 24-7, 365, you know, it, it is not the IT networks, the enterprise networks we have today. They are not going to be the ones. The technology we're using today is not going to allow those, those factories to run 24-7, 365, safety critical interacting with humans. That is not going to work. You know, you, you can, you know, you can look at telemedicine, you can look at education. I, I think, you know, when we step back and look at that kind of network with real time, high performance, low latency, that you can remotely have operators doing very precise things. Um, it, it's going to be tremendous, and it's going to offer huge new economic opportunities. Um, but there's some significant challenges, and I think uh, that's what will be very interesting. And we're going to need some breakthroughs uh, in, the, in the academia to help us get there from here. Okay, and so I'd like to hear from your side now. What do you think industry needs to do to have, to work better with academia? We're better with academia. All right. Actually, uh, okay. uh, it's a little bit similar to what I, I mentioned earlier. For senior students, as a fourth year students or graduate students, I would like to see more collaborations. And for some of them, if the industry can have some open problem or just to let the students to think about the solutions to some of the problems for it come up with their own uh, smart solutions to whatever the problem they face in, in their daily life, okay, that could be uh, valuable. Because some of the problems okay, may be fabricated by, by us, by engineers sometimes, but they are the ones, the young people are the ones who actually use a lot more than, than, than me, for example. So one thing I'd like to ask everyone to consider is that um, I think as Canadians, we need a slight change in culture and thinking. And I can tell you as someone that's been a university researcher, and in fact my PhD dissertation was looking at AI technologies way back when, when we thought we were going to try to create machines that think like humans. Then I've worked in a big company, and I've been in product management, R&D, I have done um, marketing, I've done marketing, I've done communications, and what I found was that engineers walked around thinking that if you're not an engineer, you must be dumb. And so that comes from somewhere, and by the time they come into university, they already think that. And then what they don't understand is that, what they didn't understand was, well, if you're in marketing, you must be stupid or not so smart. On the other hand, what they didn't understand was the job of marketing is to take the stuff that the engineers throw at the wall and make it consumable for people so they can make a buying decision. So there's a change of culture we need where we need better and we need to bring together those teams, and I'm speaking from my experience now, to allow a well-rounded team to actually succeed. And this is something that what I see when I go down to Silicon Valley is there is the understanding that those belong together. And I see, you know, universities like Stanford having weekend workshops where they look to create not inventors. They look to create true entrepreneurs. And that's what I hope we can build here in Canada. Okay, one last thing. Uh, so this is about smart cities and smart infrastructure, and we haven't talked about that yet. And so I think we must understand and discuss a bit about how is everything we're talking about, open networking, innovation, AI, creating uh, well-rounded entrepreneurs. How's that gonna impact the smart city market? And where do we become leaders? So there's a 
huge opportunity for us. And, and I know Rich is actually uh, behind this in a big way on the Smart Cities concept. Um, so, so for anybody who was, who was around here in the, uh, in the 90s, I think it was Sun Microsystems, that the catchphrase they had for a while was, the network is the computer. Um, where it is for us right now. Yeah, and that was, it was, a, it was a great saying. We never actually made it all work, but it was close. Um, but, but right now it is, the network is the application. And what is the application? The answer to that is we don't know. When we think about smart cities, and, and I had a, a conversation with Mike Weir, the, the CTO at Sengen, uh, a few months ago, where we were talking about the applications and building the environment, and I kind of looked at Mike and said, well, what are the applications? And the answer was, we don't know. We know some of them. We know autonomous vehicles will have to interact with a, with a smart city in a big way. Um, well, what about dust? Dust is these little moats that you sprinkle on the bridges, and the bridges go home and they go on rusting, and somebody has to come out and replace some metal. Um, you know, traffic, security. The answer is we, we, in an open networking environment, we have to build uh, an infrastructure that anticipates virtually anything. And so that, is, that actually requires a very well thought out interface, because I don't know exactly what we're going to ask the network to do. I just know it's going to be asked to do it. And, and so if we can just, you know, using three or four potential technologies or core standards, um, build that network up so that, yeah, you, anything you can, uh, you can conceive of, um, you can actually deploy uh, on this network. Okay. How about uh, from your perspective? Well, I guess uh, smart cities, I kind of look at it as, as the enabler. Right? Like we're talking about growing an ecosystem. And we need that infrastructure to foster that collaboration. And to have a smart city that companies want to locate in the small, medium businesses we talked about earlier, that are really the the the, the, uh, the innovative uh, engine, right? We need to be able to attract those and give them the, the ability to collaborate with other companies, right? So I think it, it's it's basically the the lifeblood of a smart uh, of a city, you know, is to be smart, to be connected, to be able to attract those companies, to create that ecosystem. So uh, I, I think it's a, it's a necessity that we need to embrace and, and figure out how do we uh, how do we get there as quickly as possible. And what about from your perspective? Well, I think uh, Rich concluded in his talk. If it's not connected, it's, it is not smart. Well, this this uh, like uh, all just said is necessity. Okay, the, the infrastructure, everything should be connected. But on the other hand, if things are connected. It may not be smart. So how to leverage the infrastructure and actually create a smart solutions or smart uh, applications? That could be another challenging task. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, and I'd like to open the floor to questions. So, uh, if anybody would like to ask a question to the panel, uh, please raise your hand. We have a microphone standing by. There's somebody there. One brave soul. Let's kick it off. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, for today. First of all, Sanjan and everyone here at the panel. Uh, my question is, what, where do you see a smart grid being applied in all of this? Smart energy grid. Thank you. So it's a, it's a component um, of, of the smart city. Um, you know, I think, it, again, it's, it's sort of the point of we don't know what the end thing is going to look like. We're putting components together that all need to communicate or need to support that ability to communicate. And it's just, it's one of uh, the many components that gets plugged in. And then it's anticipating what does that deliver? What service does that deliver? How do we actually use that? How do we access it? And, and so we don't know the answer to that. We just know somehow we have to integrate it into a, into a fabric uh, that we're able to access. Yeah, I, I think that it's a critical infrastructure. Right. And uh, there's many components, and uh, I think if you look at within the concept of 5G, they talk about sort of network slicing, right, where you can dedicate portions of the network for certain applications or services, right. And uh, you know, going back years, you could almost think of it as sort of VPNs or private networks or even you know physically separate networks. We're not going to have a luxury to uh, build physically separated networks anymore, right? drive economic value by having one network 
and then being able to logically or virtually slice that to offer different capabilities. And I believe critical infrastructure, like energy, will be one of those that needs to be a slice, and, and certain parameters and SLAs and performance need to be uh, there, right? And, and that will be a totally, uh, you know, a, a, a revolutionary kind of concept that we need to we need to get towards beyond sort of the enterprise thinking, more, uh, you know, I don't want to use carrier grade or high availability. That's the kind of attributes that we need and uh, are really critical for that. Thank you. We had a question back over there. I'm not sure where the mic is right now. In my hand. <laughs> the, uh, so discussing the network. Uh, one of the things I know is that uh, I, I've been in discussions with people who have who have routinely dug up the same road to lay their own fiber. So Talos has got their fiber, and Bell's got their fiber, and Mark's got their fiber. Uh, surprising to me, OC Transpo has got their own fiber, Hydro is building their own fiber. That's a crazy thought. Uh, we used to, back 100 years ago, if you wanted water, you'd build a well. And then we said, you know, in an urban environment, that doesn't make much sense. And people used to build private roads, and we don't do that anymore. So I see Councillor Jan Harder here, who's I think one of the leaders in city council in this area, thinking that we need to start treating bandwidth as a utility and have somebody come in and say, look, we've got to pull this together. So my question to you is, is there a logical provider? Is there a logical uh, organization to take charge of this and make it happen? If you look at Chattanooga, for example, it was the Power Corporation who did that. I got their, got their behind suit off by Comcast, finally won that, and so now Chattanooga has got 10 gigabyte to the desktop for $299 a month, or a gigabyte for $79 a month. And the irony of ironies is that Dave Ratanja, who is the co-chair of Invest Ottawa, was in Chattanooga to cut the ribbon on the 10 gigabyte project because that equipment is made here, across the street. So interesting, I think you've got this opportunity here, but somebody needs to jump on it. Is there a logical person to jump on it? Wow, is that a very tough question? Uh, the first thing I think is, what do you jump on? Um, you know, is it, is it net neutrality? Is it a defined amount of bandwidth for every person on the planet? Is it, you know, what is connectivity? And then is it fiber, is it wireless? How does, it, how does that go? And then what's the position of, of policy uh, in all of that? And, and policy is something that we didn't talk about today. And so I might fall on that side. Um, there are a bunch of people in this room I know who are extremely frustrated, um, who have been trying to drive policy in, in a direction that can help answer a question like that. Uh, so I, I think maybe we have the answers, but we don't have the power. And, and I, I, you know, in a cons consultative process, so do we involve government or not? Um, well, they're the only ones that can actually set that policy. And, and so I think, you know, the answer is, uh, much as I don't like it, that's where it has to start. I think that particular initiative has to be driven back to, uh, back towards us. Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, you know, it's, uh it's not an easy one, but I think the most important thing is to have the conversation, be able to place to have a table and look for those opportunities. You know, similarly, uh, you know, looking at autonomous driving, you know, there's going to have to be an investment made somewhere within the network, right? These, you know, you look at these very dense urban areas where they need 3D mapping for the autonomous cars. Right? Who's going to make the investment? Who's going to own the mapping? Who's going to who's going to do it? Is it the network? Is it the city? Is it the automotive company? Who who, who is it? Um, you know, these are big questions. They're they're tough ones, but I think we need to be able to have to have those conversations and foster those conversations. And whether it's it's Syngen or another consortium or, or some way to to table these, right? To have the conversation and look for the opportunities. Whether it's going to be an entrepreneur that's going to step up and see that business case and figure out how to monetize with over the top services or if it's going to be a local government that wants to invest um, to, to attract companies or businesses or to lead the way. Um, you know, I think there's, there's not going to be one answer, but I think the important thing is to have the conversation, have a place to have the conversation, and, and encourage the dialogue. Q&A should be 5 minutes off from you. You have 50% of the automobile operating system. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, we do have someone here. Um, so on the question of partnerships, I've been spending a lot of time recently in uh, Toronto and Montreal, one of the other big areas of 
Canadian leadership is in deep learning with Joshua Tangier and Jeff Hinton. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on uh, the partnerships that we can bring together, bringing Canadian leadership in deep learning together with Canadian leadership in uh, software-defined networks. So it, it's uh, 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 on the deep learning side, I, I would say, you know, I'll stay away just from that specifically, but if you look at software-defined networking and how it's evolved, uh, and where it started, there's the Open Networking Foundation, there's ODL, um, there's, there's uh, OnLab, there are a number, uh, OPNFV that, that Sengen's very, very involved in. And these have been really strong examples of industry collaboration where, where sworn enemies have actually gotten together, um, realizing that, that you know, we will carry the battle further forward, but we better get together and, and you know, make sure that we're all all kind of fighting the same war and how we're going to go ahead and, and try and solve that. And, and so I think um, from the openness perspective, what we've seen there is a, a much stronger willingness, I think, for, the, for the, the, the industry as a whole to get together and try and define the problems and then try and create a solution at the level where perhaps there's no unique value for one company to add. It's like, let's build the base infrastructure that we all agree is kind of the right thing and we've got these standards to to allow it to interoperate. Uh, strangely enough, it, this is telephony from 30 years ago. We're, you know, we're, we're kind of doing the same thing all over again. So there are lessons there for us to learn and lessons on where do we differentiate, where don't we differentiate uh, as businesses. Well, deep learning or machine learning in general is definitely important to help uh, SDN to make uh, decisions, especially real-time decisions. So that's a, that's a very critical part of the uh, smart uh, infrastructure, smart cities, or smart uh, things. In fact, I don't know how many people noticed that uh, Juniper just bought uh, a small company focused on AI. And I actually was just at Juniper's analyst conference uh, in October, speaking with uh, their CTO, and they had identified uh, that the concept of self-driving network was a definite priority for them. And he was talking about how hard it was to find skilled people in that area, data scientists, people that could do, that work the magic, or magic uh, elements uh, in that. And that's probably why they bought that company, because it was more about getting the team than it was necessarily about uh, any underlying product they may have had at this point. So with that, uh, I'm just about out of time. And so I'd like to close on... Oh, one more. Oh, there's room for one more. Is there a question? Go ahead. I'm not sure if it's on as much a question, but more of a maybe a challenge to some of the panel members. Um, out of the discussion was about partnership in industry, academia. I'm a professor of, uh, I'm a colleague of Professor Lang. I'm in the same department, so I want to pick up on that topic. I actually agree that uh, getting like problems, having students working on academic, on industry problems is a good thing. But I think Chang is way too polite. I think you could push for way more. Um, to give you a few examples, one of our colleagues just spent month, uh, four months at Shopify. He came back and he was completely, well, not a changed person, but he started introducing a new course, right? And so there's much more potential for collaborations than just having students working on projects we get from industry. Uh, you could do, as I said, you could have host faculty members. Um, when you start things like uh, any type of collaboration, you could have faculty members in it right from the beginning, figuring out what is it that motivates them. Uh, when IBM started CAS, they, they took a year to talk to a lot of faculty members from universities like Waterloo and Western to say, why would academics really get involved? What is it that academics need to get out of it? And CAS had a really high buy-in on the academic side. Um, last week, some of us went to Cisco, and we talked to Cisco, and it's the first meeting, right? You get this feeling that my, that's my personal impression, that the Cisco engineers, they talk about problems here, and we talk about problems here. So one of the outcomes of that was to say, well, maybe we should do this more often, so that we understand what Cisco needs and wants, but also Cisco understands what it is we're doing. Right? So I think other than these uh, the proposals that Professor Lang put out, there's other um, potential collaborations, and I've been in order for 20 years, and I don't think we have actually maximized those capabilities and potentials we have. I, I'm on the same page. Uh, we do have one more comment. Uh, we can just pass the microphone over here up front. Cliff, I, uh, I also run out of time when I was speaking at the 
There's a couple of things I wanted to make, and it, it came up with the team here discussion. The fact of the matter is, it is tough to commercialize. It's tougher to commercialize than it is to develop 20 million lines of code, even if they're perfect. How do you actually get to market and generate sales? It, it's back to one of the points I made. It's called an ecosystem. So I'd like to talk a little bit about timing and an ecosystem, which we actually do have here in the city. Last week was, uh, you might recall, SAS North. It was a trial downtown. Over 800 people turned up, more than half of them not from Ottawa, 30% out of Canada. Timing, the whole world of SaaS, the world of cloud, low latency broadband wireless, this is upon us. And the growth, as I mentioned earlier, is quite unbelievable. So, and your chart shows that a huge amount of the opportunities from enterprises I know that. So one of the things I've done in my career is open up for partnerships. Mitel is not what Mitel was even 10 years ago. You may have missed that about 2008, the whole market was consolidating. So we began on a, on a course of acquiring Intertel. Today, Mitel is what was Ericsson, what was Matra, what was DTV, what was ASCOM? What was Intertel? The client list for enterprises is beyond belief. Millions of clients. Average number of people at the end of those PBXs, 100. So one of the things the company's done, and it's not announced yet, but very early next year, is a dramatic increase on the partnering via an API. So things that need communicating run on the API, then you get the channels to market. That means the Mitel distributors that are out there that have sold literally millions of systems suddenly want the added value that goes with the call control that's underlying for literally tens of millions of customers. I was very pleased with SAS North last week. Over 800 people turned up. Timing is almost everything in life. SAS is upon us. Wireless is upon us to 5G. We absolutely have to take advantage of it. And I'm delighted that uh, Gen is here today. It's just great. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Uh, so with that, uh, yes, I'm definitely out of time. And uh, I want to thank the panel members for the discussion. I also want to thank the audience for being patient. And thank Gen for the opportunity to be here. As a Canadian that wants to help make a difference, uh, when I first met Rich, uh, I realized we were on the same wavelength, and uh, I'm happy to be here today uh, as part of the, the first Sengen Summit, and also proud to be a local Ottawa person.